Welcome everyone to the L7C podcast. Today we have a jam-packed episode for you all today. Today we have the queen herself, Chelsea Police, with us. How are you doing today, ma'am? I am doing well. Excited for what we have in store for everyone today. Yeah, and we are recording. It is March, so it is his Women's History Month. So happy Women's History Month. If this is the first podcast you are listening to in the month of March, just wanted to make sure we got that out there. And yeah, we have so much that we are about to be getting into today. And we're just going to dive right into it since we have so much to uh, cover. Uh, begrudgingly to Chelsea, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl. Uh, Tom Brady got another Super Bowl and a Super Bowl MVP. And with him winning his seventh Super Bowl, uh, you guys won't can't see, but she's not happy. With him winning his seventh, a lot of things came out that um, that night, that week. And it was all centered around Tom Brady. And we eclipsed the greatest uh, NFL player, greatest quarterback of all time, to now saying that Tom Brady is potentially the greatest GOAT of all time. So the GOAT of GOAT and the greatest athlete of all time. So that obviously caused a huge stir. Uh, People saying they agree, saying they don't. Uh, People bringing up the different sport. And then we went from that. The first people who really brought it out was the Athletic and then ESPN undefeated. All of them, uh, 5038, all followed through. Then Sports Center, a couple of weeks after that, uh, posted this picture. You guys won't see it, so I'll describe it for you. Uh, with so many goats, who's your goat? Uh, right in front was Michael Jordan. And then you had Tom Brady. Um, in the front as well. You have LeBron James in the front. Uh, Muhammad Ali in the front. Boy Mayweather in the front. Uh, behind Tom Brady, you have someone Tiger Woods. And then if you squint down and you see people, you see uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Lionel Messi in the back. Uh, you even see, I think, Roger Federer uh, in the back. And then in the way, way back, was uh, Serena Williams, and this caused a another omega uh, stir in the sports world of her being in the backpack. If you have to squint to see her, me who I have glasses and I had to look real close to see her, and um, a mission of other women who weren't on there. Simone Biles had issue with that, saying that she could think of a whole bunch of women who should be on there, and it got a little. It got really bad that Sports Center actually deleted that tweet. Luckily for us, the internet is forever, so we were able to get a screenshot of it. So, with that being said, Kelsey, I already know you do not like Tom Brady, but you are a sports fanatic, and you know what his accomplishments mean to the game of football. But what did you think about everyone now saying he is the goat of goats in this whole controversy? that happened so my feelings about tom brady aside i you know i have always been someone that has said i don't like him for various reasons number one being that he's a cheater um we know what has happened with spygate some other things that have happened in the patriots organization etc so all of that aside i still putting any biases that i have towards tom brady um, aside, not thinking about those, I still don't think he's the goat of goats. Yes, he has accomplished a ton as an NFL quarterback, um, you know, as an athlete. But we have to consider the fact that he does it on a team. Now, there are a lot of things that he probably does in terms of preparation, um, you know, making sure that he's the best at what he does. But he also relies so heavily on other individuals to be successful. And that's not to say that that doesn't make you a great athlete, but we think about other instances. Number one, Serena Williams. What she's accomplished on her own is incredible. She has 23 Grand Slam titles, all singles. Um, She has 
titles with her sisters or with her sister Venus. Just incredible things. Same thing with Simone. Yes, she has some team gold medals, but the number of individual medals that she has won is incredible. And that's because of her own physical ability, her dominance of the sport that she competes in, that she doesn't have to rely on on anybody else. And even more so with Simone, her own international federation has done plenty to make sure that she doesn't exceed her competition. Um, Some of the skills that are named after her have been severely undervalued because the FIG, the federal or the um, International Federation for Gymnastics says that they're too dangerous and that gymnasts shouldn't be encouraged to attempt some of those um, skills. And so number one, that tells me that she should be at the top of that conversation in terms of goats. Same with Serena Williams. And that's not even you know, the pinnacle of it. Yes. You know, there are some great men's athletes out there that could make the same argument. Um, Michael Phelps, for instance, you know, he has the most gold medals of any swimmer anywhere. And so I think the problem that I have the most with these conversations is number one, it's really difficult to compare across sports, but we also have to consider what you know, individual athletes have to do on their own compared to those who compete on teams. And so for someone to say that Tom Brady is the absolute GOAT, he's the best athlete to ever live, I think that's really unfair. And I would say that for any football player, to be honest, um, because it's it's so different when you're playing on a team. And you know, Tom Brady could have a shit season, but, you know, he could come out and win the Super Bowl because everybody else around him plays really well or their defense plays really well. And he has no impact on that. So, you know, it's it's a tough conversation. And I understand why some people, you know, have that when looking at just his accolades alone. But when you don't have people like Serena Williams or Simone Biles or even Katie Ledecky in that conversation, then you need to reevaluate what you're using as your criteria to define who is the goat of goats in this instance. Yeah, with Tom Brady's thing, because obviously it happened right after you won the Super Bowl. And then, I mean, it's never going to happen again. Uh, Ten Super Bowl appearances, seven wins. That's just not going to happen. And I know the NFL aficionados, they talked about just how hard to put it in layman's terms because we know it's a salary cap league. You can't go out and get all the best players like you could in baseball. And for him to do what he did, that's what uh, came out to be. My biggest problem was that it became two different things. It was the greatest of the greatest and then the greatest athlete. And I mean, I, I wanted to know what they're defining as an athlete because If we're just talking about the core basis of an athlete, physical strength, speed, agility, Tom Brady is nowhere near that. Um, To be honest, there's a lot of people who've been listed who are not the fastest in the world. The only person who can claim he's the fastest person ever, who is another person who wasn't mentioned, was Usain Bolt. He can claim that he is the fastest human being that God ever created. It is fact. There's numbers behind it, everything. He can claim that he wasn't uh, someone listed. So that one, I I don't understand how he went to greatest athlete on that. Now, the goat of goats thing, that is like a lot of things. It's your uh, personal preference. Whoever you put on top is whoever you put on top. But the omission of the women, I think, was the biggest problem. Like, I'm still looking at that ESPN picture right now. And the fact that Serena is in the backpack behind uh, Floyd and is looking like when I zoomed in, it's, I think it's Federer and Nadal who are next to her, but they're in the backpack. So I, I didn't understand why, one, there's only one female and she's in the backpack. I, 100 percent understand why michael jordan is in the front and um muhammad ali and all of that but i don't even understand why serena is way in the back behind floyd uh 
that confused me and Simone not being on it too. That goes to a bigger thing of maybe it's the sport that she plays. And we've talked about this before that the sport that she plays, most casual people only care about it once every four years. Uh, once the Olympics comes, everyone on earth is magically team Simone Biles. Everyone on earth for that time period. Then once the Olympics are over, they're criticizing her for doing a commercial with someone from Queer Eye. Those are the same type of people. So those are the uh, problems that I have with it. I also had a problem with seeing people's definitions of why they put so-and-so in front of so-and-so. And each person on this, just from this picture, and you already talked about some of like, there are moves that are illegal because she's the only one on planet Earth who can do. But everyone on this picture affected the sport some way and another in a different way. Obviously, Michael Jordan, I mean, he was the first athlete billionaire and his record and all that stuff speaks for itself and what he's done for sports in North America to make it more worldwide, especially the NBA. I mean, that's a given. Muhammad Ali is, is a given. I mean, if I really had to objectively, I would personally pick Muhammad. Uh, Serena, 23, if you just said 23 championships, just think of it as 23 championships. And obviously, one of the more famous ones that she won when she was seven months pregnant. Six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks pregnant. And then uh, another person who, I mean, he's not even on this picture, another Olympic sport besides Simone and Usain. Michael Phelps is nowhere to be found, and he's the most decorated uh, Olympian. And you would think that the person who's the most decorated in the only contest that has everyone literally the best in the world would be on there, but he's not. But honestly, with the sports center thing, I think it's more of the sports they cover that were on the front. I mean, obviously, they have the partnership with uh, the NBA, the NFL, uh, boxing. Uh, they really don't have anything with golf, but Tiger's Tiger. Soccer is in the way back because they don't do anything with soccer. And tennis and stuff is in the way back because they don't do anything really with tennis. And you think of other people like Wayne Gretzky, who should be on there. And so those are the type of things where I was more mad that there was less women uh, on that. And we even talked about if you wanted to include everyone, you could have just done two pictures. You could have had that yeah. picture and then another picture. I think it's it's important to to note, though, that that picture actually is like fan art. So that wasn't created by SportsCenter. Um, it was grabbed from somebody else who created that. So I do think that that's important to know in, in this conversation. So this was a fan's interpretation of the GOAT. Now, what I find really irritating with Sports Center is that they took this and, and again, said, who's your GOAT of GOATs? Like, mm -hmm. had this conversation and, and put this out on Twitter and not even considering the fact that there is one female athlete that's featured on this. And to be perfectly honest, when you look at the photo, if you didn't know that that was Serena Williams, you would not recognize her. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like her at all. And again, it's a fan interpretation. Maybe they drew it. They, you know, did whatever with it. And so it didn't come from Sports Center specifically, but I think it does a massive disservice that they retweeted or used this in individual's image and didn't even consider the fact that people would be upset by the lack of a female representation in it. Now, again, if that's that fan's particular, you know, opinion on the idea of the GOAT, that's, that's their opinion. That's fine. But for a major sports outlet to not even think twice about, about that and, and the possibility that there would be backlash, that's where I have a massive problem. I, I think that Again, you know, we go back to this over and over again about the lack of coverage for women's sports and people just suddenly forgetting that women's sports even exist. This is a prime example. And, and it could have easily have been something where Sports Center, for, you know, framed this in a very different way, didn't use that terminology, gave the artist credit for what it is that they did. And said, hey, but we have these other individuals that are great athletes too, or or something along those lines. Or 
even ask the artists to do another picture with some of the greatest female athletes in the world as well. So I, I think that it, it is sports center's fault in, in that respect that they didn't think through the fact that people would be upset that there wasn't more female representation and that it wouldn't be, um, you know, scrutinized. And for Simone to come out and say, Hey, like, you know, there are so many women that could have been featured in this picture. Um, and then she even went on the today show and, and they asked her about her, they talked about it and, and she listed some athletes that she thought should be on there from Katie Ledecky to Alex Morgan to Simone Manuel, um, several others. And she didn't even name herself. Like that's, that says a lot about her. And you know, she knows she's accomplished a lot in, in the sport of gymnastics. But she was like, there are so many other women that deserve to be a part of this conversation. And for, for Sports Center, not even to, you know, acknowledge that or even put out, you know, some kind of a statement saying we recognize what we did and that we're working to improve and, and understand that women's sports do exist and that representation matters. And, you know, kind of, you know, as cookie cutter as that sounds, you know, they do need to take some ownership in, in the backlash beyond just simply deleting the tweet and saying, whoops, we messed up, but we're not going to say anything else beyond that. Yeah. A couple of things. One, that's good on you to note that it was a fan who made the picture. But with that too, I don't know how that works too with major labels and whatnot. Do they just take it, then credit them, or they message them saying, hey, this is ESPN, we want to use your picture. So we don't know the conversation with that. Maybe he or she, because whoever it was, asked to like, did you want me to make another one? Oh no, this is fine. So if you didn't look at the fine print, you wouldn't even know that it was made by someone else. But I mean, they use it as their own. Like you said, they asked the question, who's the goat of goats? Before my other thing, side point, you said Simone named Alex Morgan. Or maybe, maybe it was Megan Rapino. It was a well, soccer I was, player. I was gonna ask. Are either of them, in your objective opinion, are either of them better than Mia? I would think Mia would be on before either of those do. Yeah, and I think this it, is not, it's a, this is just objective, just asking. Yeah, 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 and I think it's a generational thing. Um, you know, she probably, and I don't want to speak for her, obviously, but you know, if she if she's not a soccer fan now, or she's slowly becoming a soccer fan, she probably didn't you know, watch me a play or have any, you know, kind of relationship to her as a player. And so it could just be, these are the the athletes that I see today um, that should be in that conversation. And, and again, it, it could just be that she's not super familiar with Mia and, and her playing style, but yeah, I, I think that's a, a conversation that is hard to have number one, because women's soccer was so different back then. Um, but I, I do think that you know, Mia Hamm should most certainly be in that conversation. I mean, she is my idol. Um, she is who I watched growing up and and wanted to be like. And and so, you know, and, and Simone and I aren't that far in age. I'm a few years older than she is. Um, and so when I was watching Mia, I was pretty young. So, you know, that next generation may really be who Simone knows more than some of the the older players or the the 99ers is there. Um, you know, known as. So it, it could just be more of a generational thing rather than an, an all out, you know, I think that these players are better than than Mia or anybody else that was on that 99, uh, 1999 World Cup team. Yeah. And then my other thing that I had a huge issue with all of this stuff is once you get in that rabbit hole on Twitter and reading the comments and reading them from both, um, when people were saying like Simone this and true to that, which I was fine with, or people saying, well, they think it's LeBron or they think it's Michael, which I'm fine with too. But seeing some of the reasoning I thought was God, God awful. Um, if someone like it was some people who was like, Oh, it's Serena. And it's Serena because this, this, and this, and Michael Jordan wasn't good anyway. I was like, well, you just discredit yourself. So I'm not going to take, your opinion or it's like oh it's lebron james this is this but gymnastics looks easy so it's not someone else it's like well you just discredit yourself so i'm not going to take like your opinion so i'm just when i'm looking at it, i get it everyone has their 
favorites. But if you, I think the point of this too is if you don't pay respect to what all these people have done, then you're no better than the people coming at your person. Yeah, I think my favorite comment in, in some of those was, um, you know, talking about Simone and, and Tom Brady and someone was like, yeah, Simone Biles could totally go out on the field and throw a football. I would love to see Tom Brady get on, you know, a four inch piece of wood and do, you know, three back handsprings. Like that's clearly not going to happen. Like he's not going to be able to do that. So don't come at me and talk about how he's the greatest athlete when he wouldn't be able to do something like that. I wouldn't be able to do something like that. So I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's hard again to compare sport to sport, but I, I do think that that is a valid argument where, you know, you can't just go out and be a gymnast. Like yeah. these athletes train from the time that they're, you know, three, four, five years old and become Olympians by the time they're 16, 17, 18. I mean, Simone's still competing at 23, which in gymnastics is considered old. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard to compare, but I think that says a lot about the intensity and the caliber of athlete that you need to be in order to be able to do that. Um, and their training schedules are just ridiculous. Yes, Tom Brady probably, you know, practices a lot, but not to the extent that some of these gymnasts do and and the work that they put in and and all of that stuff. So again, it's it's comparing apples to oranges, but at the end of the day, if you ask me who is a better athlete, a gymnast or an, an NFL player, I'm going to say gym, a gymnast 900 times. Like I'm, I'm not going to ever give that to the football player because it's just not, there's no comparison in my mind. Yeah. Oh, I just want to also, because I, I just shout out the track people, but also wanted to shout out the strong men and women. They are athletes as well. And no one on this list is uh, someone who's pushing tractors and all that stuff. And like the top CrossFit people in the world, they're like almost the epitome of what an athlete is because they're able to do so many things. I just wanted to shout them out and give them love too. And I honestly think like the rankings of Goat of Goats, that's that's really personal, personal preference. Like I think we would have, I, who was just off top, who was your Goat of Goats if you even have one? Oh, that's so tough. And, you know, I could give you probably a hundred different lists for various reasons. Um, you know, I, I really think that I would have to give it to Simone. Like there just is no one else like her. And, you know, she hasn't lost a world championship since, you know, she was 13 or something ridiculous for the last 10 years. She hasn't lost an, an all around competition. And, you know, that to me just is mind blowing that she is successful still today, but not, not just successful, but she continues to get better. Like she did an interview recently um, with 60 minutes and and said that there's a possibility that there are going to be two more skills named after her after this Olympic cycle. Like that's insane. Um, you know, most gymnasts probably don't have a skill named after them at all. And now she's going to have five or six. And, and to me, that just screams goat and there's going to be nobody else like her. But the reality is she's paved the way for a lot of gymnasts. Um, you know, the diversity, I just watched the, the world or the winter cup this weekend. And the number of African-American gymnasts is significantly higher. And I think that's a lot to do with her and also Gabby Douglas and and just showing those little girls that someone who looks like them has been successful in this sport and, and you can be successful too. So, you know, again, it's it's a tough conversation and I could give you a million reasons why it's Simone. I could give you a million reasons why it's Serena or anybody else, but I, you know, it, it's one of those things that it's very personal to you. And it really comes down to what sport you watch, what knowledge you have and and how you truly frame this idea of being the greatest of all time, you know, whether it's on the field, whether it's off the field. And for me, I think Simone and Serena, to some degree, they do a lot of work in their respective sports, but it's what they do off the, the you know, the core and what they do outside of the gym that I think makes them so special in, in that respect. Yeah. I think for me, objectively, 
because this is just the age old Mount Rushmore thing. And I tell people all the time not to get offended by Mount Rushmore's because there's only four spots. You're going to leave someone out and that's okay. It's like a personal thing. Me, my three have been set for a long time. It's always been Ali, Jordan, Serena. Uh, the fourth one, which is always the hardest on Mount Rushmore, is always up for the bait. But I feel like those three uh, just change not just their sports, but sports in general for a multitude of different reasons. Now, one who is my per this is an object of my personal, personal, personal favorite goat of goats. He was a goat at the time would have been Je it is jesse owens and the reason being is that me and you joke about all the time how people can't take the heat on twitter and delete tweets and all of that stuff but and we talked about representation with simone with african-american women and all that but no one and i saw it and i've watched stuff no one could tell me different that jesse owens a black man went to not just any olympics he went to hitler adolf hitler's olympics and won four gold medals. That to me is probably the greatest accomplishment, me personally, just because it's Adolf freaking Hitler. Come on, guys. And so, and him doing that in front of Hitler and all those people, I mean, there, there'll be no accomplishment. To me personally, that's bigger than what he did. That's a personal thing. Objectively, it's those three and whoever you want to throw in. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great point. Like we all have our own experiences and things in sport that are that matter to us and and affect us all in different ways. And so, you know, something like that, you know, for you, that that's a representation thing. And that's something that, you know, people probably said he couldn't do, or, you know, Hitler said, you know, we're gonna come out and we're gonna beat him. And and, you know, that obviously didn't happen you know, but for someone else that may not be in their, their purview in the same way. And so, you know, people who have these opinions about, you know, the greatest of all time and, and who the best athletes are, you do have to consider what their perspective is and, and what it means to that individual to see, you know, someone who looks like you or, you know, plays the same sport as you or, or whatever it is, or how they've influenced you personally to, to take that role. So, you know, I'm not the biggest basketball fan. So, you know, I, I know that Jordan and LeBron have both done some really great things for the sport of basketball, but, you know, to be perfectly honest, they're probably not up in my top just because I, I'm not attached to basketball that much. And well, yes, I know some of the great things that they've done. It's just not, they're just not the first people I think of. And so, you know, someone's going to say, well, you have no, you know, that completely discredits you because you don't, you don't know, or you don't understand what they've done. And, and I think that's unfair because yes, I do recognize, you know, what Michael Jordan did and, and what LeBron's done and continues to do for himself on the basketball court, but also off the court. But again, it just comes down to what my perspective is and, and where I spend my time in terms of sport and you know, to be perfectly honest, I spend a lot of time watching women's sports and, and, you know, soccer and some of those other things. And so, you know, I, I certainly don't think certain soccer players deserve to be in that conversation. Um, but again, that's from an American's perspective where soccer hasn't and, and still doesn't continue to be a popular sport. It's, it's growing and it's becoming more popular and, and, we're seeing a lot more Americans go overseas and play professionally, which I think is great. But until that happens on a regular basis, until we grow the sport of soccer itself, soccer, American soccer players are never going to be in that conversation. And so again, like it really just comes down to where you sit your situate yourself in this conversation in the world of sports for you to make that judgment and that call. So if someone, you know, for instance, never watches a women's sport, Certain, yeah, they're never going to mention a, uh, a woman in in their top five, top four, however you're you're you know framing it. So that makes a lot of sense in their minds. In my mind, that doesn't make sense. But again, it's it's where you situate yourself, and and it's how you consume and understand sport for you to be able to make those decisions about who's the best. Yeah, and what you said. I just want to go back to my point earlier that. What you just said, it doesn't discredit you. Like when you were just talking about LeBron and MJ, that doesn't discredit you because you just said you 
you don't watch, you're not like in tune with basketball, that, but you understand what they've both done. What discredits someone is that you say, like I said earlier, oh, Serena and Simone are the goat of goats because these people suck. That's when you're just like, what the, yeah, that's when you're, nah, you should read up. And then if after you know what they've done and you still say that, then that's fine, but just don't say they suck and you've never watched or even know what they've done. Those are the fast sports fans who say, oh, Serena's the GOAT because LeBron James never won a title. Those are idiots. But yeah, it's it's an interesting thing and it's going to continue going on. Um, if the Lakers win the championship this year and LeBron has five titles, it'll be brought back right up again. So it'll be a continuous thing. And God, God forbid, if Tom Brady gets number eight, then it's really going to ramp up but we'll see going forward but another thing that we have been covering forever the atlanta dream the wmea team uh was finally sold which god we've been covering this since they revolted wore the shirts uh people like speaking of him lebron thinking about trying to buy the team with a group and they sold around february 26th actually and chelsea what'd you Think about them being sold. We thought it might happen, but it actually did happen. I am thrilled. I think this is absolutely incredible. I think this sends an incredibly powerful message to people who don't um, have open minds, who are, you know, continually being bigots, for lack of a better term, I guess, um, that there's no place for it in the WNBA. And I honestly cannot even get over how great this is. Like for the WNBA to say, take such a strong stand to help flip the Senate um, and then ultimately have this big of an impact to the point that they caused this individual to sell her shares, her stake in the team is unbelievable. Like, and I don't say unbelievable in the fact that I think that the WNBA couldn't get it done because they have shown time and time again that they are at the forefront of social justice and, um, you know, this great effort to improve the game of basketball, not just from a playing perspective, but from a social and um, just progressive manner. I'm talking unbelievable in the fact that it, it, happened and it happened so quickly and it really comes down to the WNBA just knowing exactly what it is they want and what they want their league to be like and not taking no for an answer um to me i i you know i don't think there's any better way for an organization to move forward than for the team or the players and and teams to have that much of an impact where they knew that if this individual stayed within the organization, they weren't going to tolerate it. And if that means they weren't going to play, you better believe those players were going to sit down and not play because they truly believe in what it is they stand for and, and what it is they want to see out of, you know, their platforms and, and, and their just, I guess, you know, poll and, messages that they send like it just it's incredible and you know to see this go from start to finish has been awesome and i just i hope that it sends a clear message to everybody that the WNBA is here to stay and that they have a very um clear idea about what it is they want to do with the league and who's going to be involved and who's not going to be involved in that respect and Again, like I can't say enough great things about them and what they were able to accomplish. It's just, it's awesome. I, I mean, there's not much more I can say at that point. So the commissioner, Katie uh, Engelbert, said over the summer that they weren't going to force Kelly to sell her stake, which I'm actually not that, um, I, I don't want to say I'm not a fan of, but I don't want to say I am a fan of the reason being because I don't know if I'm into people telling you to share something that you bought. I mean, sell something you bought 
Reason being that if ideals shift, then you're going to have, like, if someone was, if the commissioner was like anti Black Lives Matter and an owner was pro, then they'll be like, well, nope, you got to like sell your team, like things like that. So that's what I always think about when these type of things happen. But that didn't stop them from looking for partners and stuff like that. And the three people who are a part of it, I'm going to butcher their names extremely hard. So I'm not going to say last names, but Mr. Uh, Larry, he's a chairman of a real estate equity firm in Northland. So really wasn't going to try that name. Miss Suzanne, who's that firm's chief operating officer. And mm-hmm. the biggest one, which shocked everyone, the former WNBA star Renee Montgomery. So she used to be a former player and now he is an ownership of the team. And then to my knowledge, like a majority shareholder like larry holds he's the biggest one but renee being a majority shareholder i don't think there's been a majority short shareholder in a u.s team athlete wise besides michael jordan so again if we're doing the goat of ghosts thing if you're like oh i'm up there with like a goat owning a team so i think that's really cool and then this whole process that we've been following since the very beginning and my biggest thing with all of this is that Mary, Mary Brock, who was like the main owner of it, she was silent the whole time. I know from looking at like her stuff, like her and Kelly were like personal friends, but she never said anything. And like when you look up Mary Brock, I mean, she's on the board of trustees of Spelman College, which you would think it's completely against what Kelly was talking about. And I even looked on both. Kelly and Mary's LinkedIn's today, and they still have owner of the Atlanta Dream on there, so that definitely needs to get changed. But no, this this showed to me that the shut up and dribble era is officially dead. I, I think that athletes now are, I mean, I don't want to say more socially conscious, but they're allowed to speak on it more. Like it's not something that you're in fear of your job or anything like that, that people in the nineties and eighties had, uh, they have social media to express their outlets. They have everywhere. So this just shows that players have power and they can change elections and things of that nature. And for uh, government parties, Republican, Democrats, uh, independents, or whatever, they got to pay attention to that because they have their fan bases who will follow them to the depths of earth. And you just saw what happened. And I feel like, honestly, which kind of pisses me off, is that this should be an Omega major story. I almost felt like if you weren't listening to our previous podcast, make sure you do, if you weren't doing that, or just keeping tabs on it, you would not know this happened. And that kind of irritates me because this should have been front page, first topic on first take on ESPN, first topic on Undisputed on Fox or Colin Cowherd or PTI, all that stuff. And me personally, I don't think I've seen it on any of those type of shows. I've just seen it like a little glimpse on Sports Center ones. Yeah. Yeah, and to kind of go back to your comment about the commissioner and her statement on all of this, I I do agree with you that the the league shouldn't be able to just force you to sell to some degree. But I think that there is, you know, something to be said if you're as an owner are not upholding the values and and the mission of the organization. And I think in this case with um Kelly and and her you know, stake in in some of the things that she's said and done, she 100% does not uphold the values and the mission of the league. And um, I think that should give the commissioner or, you know, the other owners the right to, you know, say that she should sell or kind of put that process in motion. Clearly, you know, something happened because ultimately the team was sold and and I'm not really sure what happened behind closed doors and and whether there was a conversation that was had or or how that all came to be, but 
you know, I, I, I do think that at some point that the commissioner needs to kind of hop in and say, you know, yes, we we want these owners and we need these owners, but not at the detriment to our players or, you know, their own personal feelings shouldn't be at the forefront of, you know, what happens in the league. And and for her to come out specifically against the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement and, and racial injustice and, and all of that stuff, like, that's kind of like, are you serious? Like, that's a moment where, like, even if that's how you feel, one, don't agree with that, you know, that perspective. But if that's how you feel, just keep it to yourself. Don't open your mouth. Don't be stupid about it. Like, and then you can keep your team and, and keep making money. Like, you know, it's it's one of those things like that she just was really dumb about how she went about this. And if she would have kept her mouth shut like her co-owner did, then, you know, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation. Obviously, the other owner, you know, sold as well. But, you know, it could be that because she was tied to this former senator that she just felt like she needed to get out also because they were so closely linked. I don't know. But, you know, I, I think that she clearly was not very smart about how she she went about this. And we've talked about this in, in past podcasts. But, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to see her go. I don't think she belongs in the WNBA. And, and the clear, the players made that very, very clear. And and obviously we saw action. And, and again, I think that's great. And, you know, to go back to it not being a major story, you know, unfortunately, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, you and I both know that women receive less than 4% of all media coverage. And, you know, it's just another one of those things, like it's going to be on Twitter and the people who are passionate about the WNBA and women's sports are going to talk about it. And everybody else is just going to be like, meh, whatever, and move on. And so I, I, I'm not surprised, but also it's, it's really frustrating because it should be a top story and it should be something that's being celebrated in the, the sport industry because it's so unique. And, you know, honestly, I think I would love to do a case study on this because um, it's just something that's never really been seen before or, or, you know, experienced before. And I think it's it's something that needs to be looked into further. Yeah. A couple of things on this one before we wrap this one up. Number one, to go back to Kelly. And we talk about this all the time that I know how IT is taking over the world, technology, all that. but. Man, if there's a career, anyone listening to this that you might want to think about that you might make a lot of money, PR, because whoever helps these people with PR are terrible. Kelly, like you already said, if she didn't care for the Black Lives Matter movement, that's her personal thing, whatever. I can't change what's in a person's heart, whatever. But you got to know that that's going to rough a lot of feathers, especially where you're at. And for you to just say it out loud, open, all of that in the middle of not just your election year, but a presidential election year, that just doesn't help you. And I'm not even, I don't even disagree with her part about like politics and sports. I get it. Back in the day, you were always raised. There's things you never talked about at like Thanksgiving. You never talked about exes and politics just because you didn't want food flying over. It was supposed to be calm stuff about family. That's how our generation and previous ones were raised like that. And obviously now people are talking about politics and stuff more openly with their families. And before all of this stuff, I would have been like, eh, I don't know if I really want politics and sports either because of course it's supposed to be a unifier and politics are the complete opposite. They're a divider. But when you bring up the point that it's okay for these athletes to donate millions and trillions of dollars to political stuff for them not get to have a say, then that's a problem. And over the years, I've come to fully understand. I was like, you know, if you want to talk about it, that's fine. But just realize that not everyone on your team has these same political views as you, just like people at work and all that. Just be respectful and all that jazz. And just to compare the media coverage, I don't have the exact stats, but something similar, which happened in the NBA uh, many years ago with Donald Sterling, who was forced to um, sell his team. And to me, to me, honest, the only reason he was forced is because his mistress 
had the recording of him saying what he said. If that recording didn't exist, I think he's still on the team to this day. And then the players are talking about uh, the Clippers and Doc Rivers, the coach. They did throw the shirts down, talked about not playing. And this was all during like Trayvon Martin and things of that nature. And you even said that the Atlanta Dream women wouldn't. They didn't have to play. They wouldn't play. But I would also go back to something we've talked about on previous ones that it's a lot easier for the NBA players not to play because they make 10 to 100 times more money than what a WNBA player makes. And I, I agree with you that the dream if it came down to it, those women would not play. But I wouldn't fault them if they did, especially if they're the only breadwinner in the family of kids and parents and all of that. And, they, and they're not playing overseas because of COVID now. So they don't make that type of money to just not get a check for a year. That's not how it works because they don't get paid that much. I'm sure someone would come and help um, from the other side, but you can never guarantee that. But I'm just proud of us for covering this from the beginning all the way to the end. It'll be interesting to see what that group does. And I don't know if this is going to change Kelly's thoughts on stuff. And Mary Brock, the other owner, she still looks like she's on a trustee of all of her stuff. So good on her. But you got to you gotta know. You got to know the climate of where you're working because that's not, a, that's not good. But speaking of climates and working and saying things at the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, Michelle, we, for those who don't know, because I actually don't think we've talked golf on here. She is a world-class golfer, one of the best um, not just females, but one of the best overall golfers on planet Earth right now. And she was drawn into some controversy. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, for those who do not speak in politics, don't know him. He was actually a former personal attorney, attorney to President Trump. There, obviously, he's not working for him anymore. He was appearing on the Steve Bannon's War Room podcast. And they were talking about Rush Limbaugh, who um, recently passed away. Uh, he was an influential right-wing talk show radio host, for those who do not know as well. And they were talking about a golf outing with Limbaugh and we. And Giuliani was talking about how there's a whole bunch of paparazzi around. And they thought it was for Limbaugh, but they uh, said that they were out there for Michelle. And this was his quote on the green is Michelle Wee, and she's getting ready to putt. Now, Michelle Wee is gorgeous. She's six feet. Uh, she has a strange putting stance, and she bends all the way over, and her panties show, and the press was going crazy. They're trying to take pictures of her panties. And I said, Rush, it's not me. It's not you. It's her panties. Uh, Giuliani ended the story by asking, is it okay to tell that joke? Well, we already told it, so I don't know if Benny responded. And then a whole bunch of things came out from that. Uh, people talking about why that was brought up, things of that nature. Michelle, we obviously said something because they were talking about her. So, Chelsea, what did you think about all of this when it came out? Um, I mean, it's disgusting. Number one, like there should never be a point where a woman's undergarment should be the the center of a conversation. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to say beyond that. Like, you know, we, we think about, you know, what women have to wear during sports. We know with tennis, they wear typically wear skirts, although that's changing a little bit. And I think again, Serena has been a big part of that change like she wore um she didn't wear a skirt for the Australian Open um so things are changing but it has been you know this understanding in certain sports that women wear certain things and you know that's just been upheld forever and you know golf is no different oftentimes they wear skirts um you know skirts might have shorts may not just kind of depends and so you know, we're putting women in this position to be scrutinized for things other than the sport they're playing. And attire is a huge part of that. 
you know, how many times do we see with certain, you know, tennis and golf, I think are really good examples where the outfits that the women in particular wear are talked about incessantly. I mean, Serena was asked about what she was wearing at the Australian Open. And I think part of that is because it was an ode to Flo Jo and, um, you know, she was really proud of, of the outfit she ultimately picked. And that's part of Serena. She's like a fashion designer. Her sister is a designer as well. And, and so that's part of their identity to some extent. But you don't see people asking that to the men. And, you know, I hate to blame the patriarchy, so to speak. But in reality, that is kind of what's happened. Um, you know, we we have these unreal expectations for women as athletes in terms of what they look like, what they wear. Um, and, and they're supposed to be pleasing to the eye in some respects. And, and, you know, I can't tell you the number of times that announcers and commentators have, you know, mentioned something about a woman's appearance, but don't do the same thing for, for men. And so, you know, this whole thing with Michelle, we like, it's, it's just disgusting that men feel that they can have those conversations and don't think that there's going to be any repercussions that it's okay to do that, that they're it is their right to talk about a woman's body or, you know, what they're wearing or, you know, when something like that happens, like she's out there to play a sport. If something like her undergarments start showing, it shouldn't be a topic of conversation. Like you should just move on, whatever. You wouldn't do that with a man. Now, obviously men typically wear pants on the golf course, maybe shorts, whatever. So there's not that likelihood of happening, but Again, it goes back to the expectations that are set for women and really it shouldn't be tolerated and there should be no reason that two grown ass men are having a conversation about another woman's body on a podcast like that. That shouldn't happen, shouldn't be recounting that incident whenever it happened. And certainly, you know, Michelle, we shouldn't have to defend herself for something that she wore that day. It's just it's. It shouldn't happen. So when I first saw this one that you shared with me, this was actually around the same time that I recorded with the other Chelsea, Chelsea Hepper, when we did Framing Britney Spears. And ever since watching that documentary, I already knew the stuff was going on, but it really omegally opened my eyes to this type of stuff. It's not as bad as Spears dealt with is 10 but it's still bad and just reading uh what i just said about giuliani saying that not just a former uh lawyer to the president of the united states but he was also mayor of governor mayor of new york one of the two and this is again with pr i don't think this would be news if he just stopped at they weren't here to see us they were here to see michelle we uh, you, I mean, you could have stopped that. She is gorgeous. Okay. And then that would have been it. She's gorgeous. She's a great golfer. They weren't here to see us. They were here to see her. You would have said that. I don't even think this is a non, this is a non issue. It's her bringing up her underwear. And even if you knew they were taking pictures of her underwear, which to me, I don't, I don't doubt him on that because the media is crazy. And I mean, if TMZ and all of that and all those people are there, I actually don't doubt him that they were doing that. But you could have took an initiative there as a former lawyer to the president saying, hey, this isn't OK. You shouldn't be taking pictures of her underwear or even just pulling her aside saying, hey, just to let you know, those people were taking pictures of your underwear. So make sure you go and reach out to them and tell them not to post the stuff. And all that, like he could have done those things, but the way that he said it in a jokingly term, and then it went from just focusing on her underwear, which, like you've already said, is a problem. But I think this is another example of there's still a lot of work to be done with um, talking about women and um, sports and all of that. But I do remember too, you brought up Serena. I don't know if she got a lot of heat, but there was one time, I forgot which tournament, that she wore the cat suit or something like that, and she got some black. Yeah, the the, the French Open actually banned 
um, cat suits after she wore that. Um, so again, it's it's a a situation where a tournament is effectively telling women what they can and ca- cannot wear. I mean, they essentially said that they have to wear a skirt when it, at the French Open. You know, and like Wimbledon, you know, you have to wear white as part of, you know, being at the All England Club. And but they, I don't think they necessarily say what all white has to be, whether it's a skirt or, you know, something else. But the French Open, you know, did come out and say that they had to wear a skirt, which, you know, Serena actually wore the cat suit for medical reasons. Um, she was dealing with blood clots in her legs. And so having the compression um you know material or whatever all the way down her legs was helping with circulation and making sure that she didn't get another blood clot so it wasn't that she was just saying like f the patriarchy i'm going to wear this cat suit she was doing it for a medical reason and then the french opens like no 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 sorry you can't do that anymore and so i think that's you know it made that cat suit so iconic um because somebody came back and made a rule and said, you can't do it anymore. But also like, it's also devastating because they're dictating what she can and can't do, even though she was doing it so that she effectively stayed alive and, and didn't have any more health issues as a result. Yeah. And, and with Michelle too, cause I had to read up on her. She's not even that much older than us. I think she's only a couple years older than us. She's about 31. And it's the age old thing with, women and sports and clothing and all that you're in even not even just sports just general newscasters all that it's damned if you do damned if you don't uh if you don't look sexy enough you're not getting a shot point blank it's unless you're omegaly talented you're not getting a shot if you don't look a certain way if you do look a certain way all it takes is in this case one older white male to say oh she's too sexy now we have a problem. And then you are, I mean, you're just to be honest, you're getting slut shamed by uh, tweets and posts and all that stuff. And then, I mean, that's not good for any person's mental health. And sometimes you have to deactivate your accounts and things like that. But if you have sponsors, you really can't do that either. So you have to just sit there and take it. And that's not good for anyone. So it's that age old thing. Damned if you do, if you do want to look sexy, damned if you don't, if you don't want to look sexy me personally i truly don't care i mean as long if you're good at the sport and you're t- fine whatever do what you want to do like i'm more interested if you're good at this or if you suck at this i mean yeah and i think a really good example of that is with maria taylor earlier um in 2020 when mm-hmm. um there was a man who who basically said she was dressed like a porn star when she was on the sideline um I can't remember if it was college or, or an NFL game, but you know, that person ended up getting fired for his comment. And again, it's one of those situations where you, as somebody randomly on Twitter, you know, if you're a reporter or just some Joe Schmo, like you have no room to talk about another individual's appearance. Like, and, and, you know, if you want to do that with your friends or your buddies, sure whatever more power to you but don't put it on the internet where everybody can see it and then you're going to get absolutely destroyed by people who are like that doesn't make sense or you're going to create a a firestorm where people are going to agree and it's just going to get so out of hand like it it just you don't need to do that and and then it you know it goes back to people deleting tweets and all this stuff or deactivating their accounts like again if you're going to have if you're going to take that chance, you're going to take that shot, then be ready to to take on the the repercussions and, and the backlash and whatever else you might get. And don't be somebody who just instantly deletes their account and can't handle it. So, I mean, we've talked about that plenty and, and that happens all the time. But yeah, I think that's a really good example of, of that situation where women just get it from anyone and, and everybody who wants to make a comment about their what they're wearing or doing or and there's just no win-win situation for them and and that's really unfortunate because there are a lot of great women who are on the field who are on sidelines that are reporting who are in um you know positions of power and there's just nothing that they can do you know to make someone happy based on what they're wearing or what they're doing yeah, and the Maria thing too. I mean, she had a bad couple of weeks because she had that. And I remember the guy was from Chicago. And then she also had the NBA mess up with not having Anthony Davis. 
on one of the all NBA teams. That was back to back weeks. And to me, I was like, yeah, that's the wrong move. But again, I didn't know if she was still dealing with because I'm not, I don't have her cell phone number. So I didn't know what she was still dealing with the backlash of that, or she just honestly forgot. And then people asking how she's on countdown when she was on this and that and college game day. But no, it's, it's one of those things that will never go away with um, women, even just take it even further with sports. It's, it's or all the other stuff. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't. But those people who, let's say with like a Michelle, we are saying, oh, she dresses like a slut, things like that. Saying that because of the way she golfs or the way the clothes she wears are the same people who, and there's no problem with that either on Instagram, liking all of the Instagram models, pictures and all that who are mm-hmm. dressed the exact same, if not more scandalous. And also to that too, that's your own personal preference. I mean, we're all trying to make money and make a living and you have to do what you have to do, but you shouldn't have to, it's not in your place to criticize what another person looks like. That's not your business. And I mean, everyone has their personal preferences on what they like physically and all that, but Michelle wasn't there to model. She wasn't there to flash anyone. She was there to play golf. And for that to be the main story was terrible. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that just because a a woman wears something, you know, that is deemed sexy or, you know, attractive or they are attractive as a human being, whatever it is, that that is not permission for a man, woman, anybody to comment on that appearance, to discredit them for being attractive or looking good in, in their respective field. Um, or just being flat out nasty. It's that is not an invitation to do that. And you wouldn't want someone to do that to do to you. And just because they're in the public eye doesn't give you the permission to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I I mean, that for me is the bottom line. Like I would, if if you're not going to say it to their face, don't hide behind your keyboard and, and say it to them on the internet, because at the end of the day, yes, they may have a platform. They may be out there for the public because they are in in the public eye and you know they might share parts of their lives that other people don't but again that doesn't give you permission to to comment on the things that they do and to be rude and to be nasty and um you know to to make comments that you wouldn't say to them in everyday life like that's just not okay yeah and it's kind of funny too because this next um one that we're going to hit real quick I don't even know if it'll be real quick. It almost the exact same thing. Uh, Twitch gamer Nega Onyx uh, tweeted about uh, she was playing a game. I actually don't remember which game she was playing, but a person in the comments while she's playing the game, just out of the blue, asked her what color underwear was she wearing? And she was just, and then she talked about how that's not right, things of that nature. And the same thing Rudy did. This guy's like, oh, You can't take a joke. So these are two completely different sports, obviously a Twitch and golf, but the same, literally the same exact thing, except this guy, we don't know who he is. And we obviously know who Rudy is, but it's the same thing. And it's something that women deal with every day, even in the gaming world. I know we haven't hit that much on it, but even in the gaming world, when you're just there playing Random people coming in there asking sexist things about what color your underwear or what size of your breasts or things like that. And like you will say, like they would have never ask a man that. And that's what women have to deal with every day. And then if you don't uh, answer them or things like that, they're just berating in your comments and then they're ruining the stream for other people. And you could potentially lose followers and what that. And that was another thing that you also shared with me as well. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what I said before, you know, still follows suit here. And, and again, to your point, like a a male streamer or gamer or whatever, isn't going to deal with, with the same things. Like there is not going to be somebody that's going to, you know, ask them a personal question about what they're wearing or anything like that in, in that setting, because they know that that won't be tolerated, but they feel like, that they have the space and the avenue to do it when you have a female 
streamer um, or gamer or whatever you want to you call them in in that respect. And you know, I have seen you know kind of firsthand. Um, you know, my fiance is a gamer, and so like there are things that happen in in that respect where if you know that it's it's a female that you know people will say things and and I just you know think that's unfair and and you know truthfully you never really know you know when gaming who's on the other side of of that keyboard obviously in this situation she's a streamer she makes herself visible to um those who who watch her streams but in in most cases you you don't know and and maybe you know from their gamer tag or or whatever but it's again there's no reason that you should be having or saying anything like that or asking those questions and i know from her situation you know she started to feel very unsafe and and unsettled by those comments and again that should just never happen like there should never be an instance where you're making somebody feel that uncomfortable that they feel unsafe in their own homes um, or, you know, in their, you know, something that they probably view as like their safety or their, you know, escape from what's going on in the world. And, and suddenly you're asking really personal questions and you're starting to impede on, on that feeling of escapism. And that's just not fair to that individual. They didn't ask for that. And before you tell me, well, they're the ones that decided to stream. You're right. They did. But they did not decide to stream with the idea that someone was going to come in and ask them what color their underwear is, you know, anything personal about them, their appearance, whether they're, you know, attractive or anything like that. And and don't tell me that you think that that's why they do it, because I'll tell you right now, it's not. Yeah, and with and with this too, the same thing I said about damn if you do, damn if you don't, and this even goes into the gaming world too. Because there have been women who have gone to extreme lengths to make sure they have a consistent following from literally streaming in swimsuit or their underwear or uh, fake giving lap dances or whatever. And they've done that because they felt like that was the only way they could get ahead. And statistically, that was showing that the women who did do that got more followers than the people who didn't. And I mean, if you're comfortable doing that, again... That is your personal thing. I just, my biggest thing is that you shouldn't have to feel like you have to do that to get ahead. Uh, someone like Ninja, who makes $30 million a year playing video games, which don't tell your parents that because our parents back in the day would say that's a joke, but 30 mil playing video games. He came out a long time ago saying that he'll never collab with like a female streamer out of um, respect or his wife or something like that. And again, that's your personal thing. That makes sense. But you're denying a whole great uh, group of women who could honestly use the rub from you because it's like, oh, because some guys are ego driven and they're just like, oh, this girl's hanging with Ninja. She must be really good. I should follow her and things like that. And also from a Ninja thing, just because you collab with a girl doesn't mean they want to sleep with you on. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I think that's what says more about Ninja than it does about anybody else. And, you know, if he doesn't feel like he can, I don't know, contain himself in an environment like that, then to be perfectly honest, as a female, I don't know that I want to put myself in that position. Because, you know, if something were to happen or, you know, something gets misconstrued, it's going to be on the, the, it's going to be the female's fault. It's going to be that female streamer's fault for that happening and and ninja's going to take no part in in that blame and whether or not he should um you know obviously we're talking hypotheticals right now but but you know that he's going to be completely innocent in all of this and it's going to come down to it being her fault because of many of the things that we've already talked about in terms of appearance and and you know she asked for it or she did this and she did that and you know we know that that's not always the case, but we want to blame somebody or our society wants to blame someone. And typically it falls on the woman in that case. And again, that says more about him than it does about anybody else. If he's not able to, you know, have a, a business relationship with somebody that is a woman because of, you know, respect for his wife. Like that's, that's bullshit in my opinion. 
Uh, last thing we really have, we couldn't have a podcast and not talk about the women's national soccer team. And Chelsea, you're the one who told me about this, and this is near and dear to your heart, so I'm just going to let you explain this. Yeah, so watching the She Believes Cup um, last week, two weeks ago, whatever it was, um, in the middle of one the U.S.'s final game, um, it was halftime halftime show they bring in and I don't even know who the individual was but it was somebody to talk about the U.S. men's national team potential Olympic roster like Olympic qualifying um, leading to Tokyo now you know you may think that that's not a huge deal but here's the problem that I have with this number one to be perfectly honest most people who are watching the U.S. women's national team really don't care about the U.S. men's national team. And there's a lot of history there, and there's a lot of reasons why that is. So for them to bring on an individual to talk about the men's national team during a women's contest is not great. Like, I hated every second of it. Um you know, I saw several tweets that are like, we don't care about the men's national team right now. We are watching the U.S. women's national team. Why are we not discussing their potential roster? Because to be perfectly honest, the the Olympic roster is 18. We as a national team, the women could probably make two Olympic teams and compete for gold and silver. Like that's how deep we are. And so um, Blacko Andonovsky is going to have a very difficult decision to narrow that roster down from what it is now to 18. Um, you know, we have a ton of players who are solid, who are great, who, um, you know, are going to be disappointed because they're going to be left off the roster. When you have the likes of Carly Lloyd, Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, um, you know, Julie Ertz, like it just, the, the list is endless. And so that halftime show, number one, should have been talking about highlights from the game. Number two should have been talking about the Olympic roster for the women's national team. There should be no conversation in there where we're talking about the men. Now, maybe you are talking about them because they have an upcoming friendly or you just want to plug that they have some games upcoming. I don't have any problem with that, but I have a problem spending 20 or 25 minutes in between have talking solely about the men's national team that should never happen and part of me says that that would not happen in a reverse scenario where if i was watching a u.s men's national team game it was in the middle of the a tournament that they created which mind you this tournament is called the she believes cup so why are we talking about men in the middle of this that's a whole different issue um but again that would not happen if the roles were re- reversed um, and it doesn't happen in the same way that it does. And I think, I, I don't know what goes through producers' minds or, you know, the, the people who organize these when they do that. It's almost as if they're like, you know, nobody really cares about women's soccer. So we're going to plug the men in, in, in this situation. And hopefully that, that garners some views and people are excited and stick around for the second half. When, mind you, the entire tournament, the entire She Believes Cup, the... Women's national team averaged 532,000 viewers for three games. Across three games, they averaged 530,000 viewers. That's a ton, and that's record-breaking. So don't come at me and say that you need to pull the men's national team in because, you know, you think that's going to keep people interested. And so I... I was livid about this whole situation. And again, if the roles were reversed, I genuinely believe that this would not have happened. How long is a woman's uh, halftime show? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, they're halftime for soccer games, probably 20 ish minutes. Um, I, I honestly haven't timed one and I haven't been to a game in forever to actually know. Um, but I would say no more than about 20 minutes because the whole like broadcast for a game is two hours. And so there's 90 minutes for the game. And so, um, there's a little bit like 30 minutes of extra, you know, 
additional time in that broadcast, but it could be that there's some extra time at the end of one or both halves um, that's, that eats into that a little bit. So I would say somewhere around 20 minutes. So if that's somewhere around 20 minutes, and you just even said that they spent maybe about 15 to 20, 25 minutes talking about the men. So that entire halftime show, they were talking about the men's soccer team, and you already said that they didn't do highlights. Uh, they didn't talk about the roster and how this team could fill two rosters and the cuts that are going to need to be made. And and you told me about this. I was watching, I think I was probably watching Ohio State College basketball or things, something like that. And I asked if this was a common thing, and you said no. And with the thing, if it was reversed, would this happen? I don't think it would happen. What what station was it? Was it on Fox? Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, like I can actually think about times when this has happened in other sports. So there are, you know, so many times when you're watching like a women's college basketball game and the commentators will, you know, hype up a, a men's game that's coming up or talk about any kind of men's sporting event that's happening um, in the distant future, like it could be tomorrow and or on Friday or some random day during the week that nobody is even thinking about yet. But here's this random game that's happening and, and that'll be brought up during a women's broadcast. And maybe that happens once or twice in the reverse, where in, if we're watching a men's basketball game or, or football game or something where a women's sport is brought up. And I think a good example of that would be where that does happen is around tournament time. I think that's about the only time that we really see that happening in the reverse. But for the most part, during the regular season, if women's basketball is on, you'll see any number of, you know, previews or um, plugs about men's games that are happening later that day, tomorrow, three days from now. And so it's this, again, this idea that men's sports are the only thing that bring viewers. And we have seen over the last six to eight months, that's just not the case. And so if you market and you plan to make sure that people know that these events are happening from a women's perspective, people are going to show up and they're going to watch them. Like that is the reality, but people don't take the time to make sure that that happens. And again, going back to less than 4%, of media coverage is devoted to women's sports. Like you could easily change that by, you know, putting more women's sports on. And and we've seen that a little bit, I think partially due to the pandemic and just not having any other options. But I hope to see that that is a trend that continues. And, and I think, you know, we have seen as of late, you know, we talked about the Atlanta dream Um, And and that no new ownership, but in the NWSL, you know, there have been three massive um, investor groups that have started to pop up with the um, Washington Spirit, the Chicago Red Stars, Um, you know, Kansas City has some big names that have invested in that group. Naomi Osaka is now an owner of the um, North Carolina Courage. Um, The LAFC has a huge ownership group with a lot of massive names, including Serena Williams. Um, Mia Hamm is a part of that. So we're starting to see people investing in women's sports. And more than that, it's women investing in women's sports. And, you know, I I think that's great. I think that's huge. Like, finally, women are saying, okay, nobody else is going to invest in us. We're going to take this into our own hands and, and make it happen and make it work. And, you know, we saw that with Alex Morgan and Sue Bird, Simone Manuel and Chloe Kim, you know, just launching their own media company. So they're finally saying, okay, we've dealt with this less than 4% of coverage for all of our playing careers. We're putting a stop to that and we're finding a way to, to give more coverage, coverage to women and to, you know, provide our own stories and our own, you know, roadmaps to what it's like to be an athlete and and be a woman, a woman in sport. And so I think there is this changing of the guard, so to speak, with women's sports and, and what's happening in the future. And women are finally saying, we're done waiting on others. We're going to take this into our own hands. We're going to show people that women's sports are huge they're up and coming and that you need to be a part of this movement otherwise you're going to be left in the dust and you know i i love it and i think it's great that it's happening in the month of march and coinciding with um women's history month and and black history month in february and 
just it's been really, really cool to see just how much things have grown just in the last few months. And I hope that these like investor groups and ownership groups that are built by women for women um, continue to, to be the trend and that people finally figure out that, you know, women's sports are here to stay as are here to stay, as I've said a million times on this podcast. Um, so yeah, I, I got off a little bit on a tangent there, but you know, I, I, I think that women's sports are, are going in the right direction and people just need to get on board and, Bottom line is don't talk about men's sports during women's sports. Like we don't, we don't want to hear about it to be perfectly honest. Yeah. So my, I'll make it short for just that with the game is if that happens on both. So if the men are playing and the women are the halftime, like same 20 minutes and it's even between them. I really don't have a problem with that. Now, if it's only, the men getting shown on the women's games and then vice versa, then I don't know nah, that doesn't really jive with me. So either do it evenly for both or don't do it at all. And even, I don't even think it should be 20 minutes. If it's a, Hey, men are playing Mexico on Tuesday on FS1, check it out. Perfect. But make sure you're doing the same thing for the women. Oh, the women are playing Brazil on ABC at 6 PM. Make sure you check it out. So I think the promotions need to be equal. And like you said, um, with the media companies and things like that, it really comes down to who runs the places. Like if they don't want to talk about it, they're not gonna talk about it. And these how these companies are ran. I mean, just even going back to like the goat thing and like seeing uh ESPN like first take do their goat stuff and i Sarita was on most people's like their top five or something but that's because you can't leave her out but there's a whole bunch of soccer players um women and obviously smoke so it's whatever these companies cover that they want to bolster out uh chelsea is there anything else you wanted uh to talk about i actually wanted to make sure i actually let you did the closing today uh, since it is Women's History Month. So I wanted to make sure you got to close this episode. So if there's nothing else you want to talk about, I'll go into my little closing bit and then you will close it out for us. Okay. Well, um, with me, obviously, thank you everyone for listening to the L7C podcast. Uh, thank you, Chelsea, for being on there and being our queen. Uh, just even want to give you more props as we are in Women's History Month and you are obviously the first woman to come on the podcast. And then since then, there have been uh, two others who are now, I think, going to be in the general rotation. And there are more women who want to be on. And I just like we talked about, representation matters. And even on our mom and Pop podcast, you being a trailblazer that you are, being one of the one of the top three most listened people on here, has shown that even just the normal women that we're friends with that they can do this, and people want to hear a woman's perspective. I think that's the biggest thing that with representation, all of that, there are people out there who want to hear a woman's perspective. They just don't have the outlet for it, no matter how big or how small you are if you don't have the outlet it's hard to get your voice out there and we've tried to provide that for women and obviously you're the first and you've inspired others so just want to give you your props on that and with it being women's history month uh the eighth the eighth is international women's day i'll be honest outside of like the major holidays i don't know when any of these start i thought the first time it started which they're marketing geniuses, of course. Uh, Marvel, because they released Captain Marvel on International Women's Day of that year. So I was just like, hmm, didn't know it was International Women's Day. Perfect for Marvel on their part. But with any of these holidays and the importance, I mean, you just got to respect women. There's no one on planet Earth who does not have a woman in their life. So just going back to 
the panties thing with the gamer, uh, Mega Onyx, and Michelle Wee. I mean, if that was your sister. You really don't want random dudes just running up on her, taking pictures of her underwear, talking about it like that. If she has your sister, mom, aunt, cousin, all of that bit. So just always think of that. And to go back to the GOAT thing, because we pay respect to all sports, forgot to talk about uh, UFC, UFC GOATs as well. John Jones, Amanda Nunes, who I think those two are the top two ever. So boy and a girl. And that's really, that's really, and also Layla Ali, another GOAT. She should be on there as well. Her just beating the hell out of everybody. So yeah, that's really all I have. And I will pass it to the queen to close. Yeah, I think, um, you know, knowing that it's Women's History Month and then, you know, with International Women's Day approaching. I just would challenge all of you out there that that listen to this episode to to check out a women's sport at some point this month, um, whether it's the NWSL, whether it's, um, you know, softball, NCAA softball is in full swing now, um, you know, women's hockey, women's basketball, whatever it is. You know, I challenge you to kind of take a few minutes and and watch some of those. And I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you see and and ultimately might make yourself um, become a fan of a new sport or a new um, just entity to watch. Because, you know, I I have said time and time again, I love to watch women's sports. I've been around them my entire life. And and I think it's really important that, that people you know, themselves watch. And, and if you've never spent the time watching a, a women's athletic competition, like I just encourage you to do that or watch something that you've never watched before. Um, give them a chance and and don't let what, you know, the media has said or individuals have said about nobody cares about women's sports because that's just not true. Um, you know, you want to be a part of the change and and we are, you know, as a society kind of shifting to um, more equity and giving more opportunities to women to really show what it is they can do. And again, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And, you know, if one day you have a daughter, you want to make sure that they have every opportunity as somebody else. So take a few minutes and, and watch some women's sports, even if it's maybe not something live, you could watch some highlights from some Olympic games. If you really want to watch somebody, watch Simone. She's impressive. Um, so yeah, just as my challenge to you would just be give women's sports a chance, give them an opportunity to show, you know, how great they are and, and the potential for them to grow in the future and, and be part of the change to make that um, something that's common in society. So that's really all I have. Um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity as always to, to come on um, and love kind of talking about something that's just near and dear to my heart. And with that being said, thank you everyone for listening to the L7C podcast. You guys take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.